Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Putting the Life Back into Life Sciences Training. My name is Amanda Brief. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at the EDUS Group, and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Now we're going to go ahead and introduce today's speakers. We have Ben Benjamin. He's a Principal Consultant with Cornerstone On Demand. He brings 20 years of regulatory and validation experience in the pharmaceutical and medical device industry. Our second presenter is Jackie Nagel, a manager at the EDUS Group. She has over 10 years experience in HR information systems management and validation for global pharmaceutical companies. Before we get started, I just wanted to walk through a few housekeeping items. Please note this webinar will be recorded and we're going to send a link to the recording later this week. Additionally, a live Q&A is going to take place after the presentation is over. So if you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A box and they may be addressed at the end of the webinar. Now we're going to take you through today's agenda. So we're going to begin by reviewing the many reasons why compliance training is challenging for life sciences organizations. Then we'll discuss how to change compliance from a checkbox mentality to one that provides more effective training. Then we'll conclude by sharing tools for effective training, including how to leverage microlearning. And as a reminder, we encourage you to join the conversation online. Feel free to tweet and socialize using the hashtag Compliance Insights. And you can follow us on Twitter using our handle, the Educe Group and Cornerstone Inc. Now with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Ben who will kick off the webinar. Thank you. Hello, this is Ben. Can you all hear me? I'm guessing yes. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today is if you look at these slides, we, uh, Jackie and I are going to tag team and present this to you. So I'll be speaking on the next uh, couple slides before Jackie comes and talks about the next few slides and so on. So we'll uh, exchange hands a few times here. But let me set the stage here and uh, talk about the quality and regulatory environment and its challenges before we go into training specifically. I think for the most part, um, all of you are very familiar with the life science industry as a whole. Now, most of you are in the pharma sector and maybe not as familiar as the uh, medical device arena, um, or maybe you are because you have certain uh, combination products regardless. Um, here's, I know it's a little bit of a busy slide, but let me just help you walk through uh, this slide because this is going to be key. Uh, let's take a moment to read this and let's take a look at the left hand side of the slide and uh, I'm going to break it down. Okay. First of all, I think we all know that the, the way the regulations are written, um, in, there's written such a way that they put you to sleep. It's a short sure way to cure insomnia. Um, uh, regardless, I mean, if we look at the jargon, at the very first bullet, it says that each manufacturer, this is coming from the 21 CFR 820, section 25, which is the medical device quality system regulation. And it says that every manufacturer should, shall establish procedures for identifying training needs and ensure that all personnel are trained, <clears throat> et cetera. Now, that in itself is not a, um, a major problem or, or difficult to understand, but look at bullet number two. So here it says, as part of their training, the personnel shall be made aware of device defects. Now, that is an additional layer here. Okay, and look at uh, bu uh, bullet number three, the last one on the left-hand side. It says that the personnel who perform DNV activities shall be made aware of defects and errors that may be encountered as part of the job function. So please note that the FDA in this case is not simply satisfied with the presence of a training record, 
okay? They're looking for something more. You know, do personnel understand the link or the connection between their job performance to the defects that they encounter? Um, have they been made aware of the errors that may be encountered when they perform VNB activities? Now, I also took a look at the um, uh, 2016 data on uh, inspectional observations regarding this. And interestingly, they don't show, they show several on training, but not particularly on effectiveness. However, don't let this give you a false sense of security. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more why I say that. But now let's look to the right-hand side of the column. I think our European counterparts are familiar with the ISO 13485. Uh, a lot more than we are on the on the U.S. side of things, uh, but very similar. Now look at the first bullet on the right hand side of the slide: personnel performing work affecting product quality shall be competent. Now don't take this as a term that is used sometimes derogatorily, like incompetent versus competent. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's it's about you know, whether you have a beginner level, um, you know, um, competence uh, in, in your training or if it's a more uh, advanced level like, uh, like experienced or if you are an expert in the field. So, so really in the innate sense, they're looking for competency, right? And in the second bullet, it talks about the effectiveness of the action. So the organizations are determine the necessary competence and evaluate the effectiveness. So training is not simply whether or not you have a training record or um, things like that. The real impact of effective versus ineffective training is felt in the defects or errors of the product. I mean, um, and also this will not be a surprise to many in the life science industry uh, industry, whether you're in the pharma or in the medical device arena, that the number one KPI, that the key performance indicator for the most part, uh, has to do with the number of defects that a product has in the organization. And that's pretty much uh, true. So now we are going to go to the next slide here and uh, talk about uh, an example, an anecdote. Um, oh, by the way, um, the other piece is that when we also look at the effectiveness, um, you know, if you want to get a little bit detailed, uh, deeper into that, the, the point I wanted to make is that the effectiveness, when you're measuring the effectiveness, the rigor of effectiveness. The effectiveness rigor is directly proportional to the risk associated with that. But anyway, let's move to the next uh, slide. Okay, I think I'm, not ha I'm having trouble moving this slide. Amanda, can you hear me? Yes, I believe I just moved okay. the slide. Yep, there okay, you go. Okay, thank you, thank you. So here in this slide, we're gonna talk about a an anecdote from the life science area. Um, again, to reinforce the, the, the fact, you know, the, to describe what the quality and regulatory environment is like. So here's an anecdote, you know, this is a real life story, or uh, the name has been changed um, just to protect the individual. Um, Dean is a, a guy who is actually very smart, okay? He adequately is trained in his work, uh, and the FDA specifically says, you know, in the particular operations he performs. He's very good at it. He's competent. He knows what he's doing. And he has adequate experience, and his job is to build servers for a major pharmaceutical company. Now, he's also trained in the recurring uh, annual current GMP training, so no issue there. 
he's he's on top of his train. Okay. And I am a quality rep assigned to this area, and I talk to him and I say, I see him um, documenting something as he's building the server, and I ask him, hey, Dean, um, do you know why you're doing this? And he says, he says, Ben, I have no idea. You know, and that is unfortunately the reality in most companies that the individuals who are down in the trenches have very little awareness as to why they're doing that. And I thought, when I first encountered that, I thought, you know, it is such a shame because this man is a very smart individual. And I don't know why he's been kept in the dark about why he's doing that. Why is he required to do what he is doing? So I spent some time with him and I realized that everyone he represented, it was, he, he was not simply an anomaly. The rest of the organization in that particular function, everybody was in a similar boat. So I held, uh, uh, it was actually an instructor-led training for an hour with this group, and at the end of the hour, each one received a, a laminated card that talked about the quality system for the, uh, for the area. And a week later, I went and talked to him, uh, a few other people in addition to Dean, to say, hey guys, do you know what you're doing? And in this time around, everybody knew exactly what they're doing. So if I, we go to advance to the next slide, please, uh, we will see that the thing that was developed was to show him a link between what he was doing down in the trenches to what was driving the organization to require him to do it, okay? So for example, in this pyramid slide, you see that at the very bottom of the slide, the installation record was what he was supposed to uh, deliver, and but he didn't know why he was required to do that. But then as I started to show him the various level, layers of requirements, you know, where this requirement is coming from, he began to see the bigger picture. So, okay, you've got the department SOP. You know, the installation SOP was there, but he had not even he had, by the way, he had trained on the SOP, but he had forgotten about it. And so, you know, we're talking about effect, we'll talk about effectiveness here in a second, but this is just to illustrate the need um, uh, for understanding uh, and setting the stage for why there is a need for effective training. So, um, I don't think I need to ex describe any more this slide, and uh, we, we can move to the next slide. So here's the question for you all who are listening. From what you've just heard, here's some recall questions. What do you think is the FDA's expectation regarding training employees and defects and errors? What is the connection? Maybe this is a, um, you can respond in your uh, chat boxes and we'll, we'll uh, uh, get to evaluate here real quick. If you are logged in and want to participate. Okay, now the second question, also similar thing. What are the two fundamental things that the ISO 1345 requires in training? And then the third one, what drives the need for an SOP? Anyway, um, I think you, you guys know the, what the answers are to this. The first answer, the first question is essentially the awareness of the employees, the awareness of their job performance and the connection to the defects and errors. That's the important key. And the second one is about effectiveness. The two fundamental things, competency and effectiveness is what is being required in training. Okay, and what drives the need for an SOP? 
the external regulations, obviously. Okay, so with that, I'm going to hand over the uh, presentation to Jackie. Jackie, you're on. Thank you, Ben. So let's talk about the compliance culture and why it matters. So we know that training, by definition, is the act of teaching a person a particular skill or behavior, while the learning definition is the actual acquisition of the knowledge or the skill through the experience that it was taught. So basically, without learning, training is simply going through the motions and just checking a box, perhaps, on a compliance report. The compliance should be coming from the top down. So an organization that actually embeds quality compliance at the core of the organization, instead of just delegating that to the culture of compliance or the quality group only, it actually inspires pride and work across the organization. And that can come in terms of reducing issues and decreasing all compliance practices, whether that be security or product, and actually making that a priority and therefore aligning with most of your mission statements, which is to ensure the quality of your patient care. Training being viewed as an investment and not a cost in the culture, so show that compliance is an opportunity that is owned by everyone and not just an obligation. So by making training an investment and not simply a cost of doing business, so we embed compliance in all employees' performance and improving their compliance skills, you're going to increase, again, that internal investment and develop your employees. By increasing your employees' knowledge and skills, you're going to reduce the risk and reduce the cost of defects that lead to CAPAs. An effective orientation process in place for all new employees. When you think about onboarding a new employee for new hire orientation, that orientation should include compliance training concepts and expectations. Again, let's align with the culture and the organization's expectations regardless of the actual department and their training requirements. The organization has specific training requirements and goals, not each individual person. And the last but not least, when you're evaluating applicants or trying to onboard new hires, dig deeper into that new hire's experience in various subjects and actually pull in new hires that have strong compliance backgrounds, again, improving your internal workforce. Next slide, please. After assessing the company culture, we're going to drill down to the next layer and understand the various individual learning styles. There are different learning styles that individuals possess, each one of us here on the conference today, and a one-size-fits-all approach generally does not work very well. A person A who gains skills and knowledge by reading doesn't mean that person B will be as effective in performing the same type of inf information or required skills by reading that same document. Perhaps a more engaging video can improve the retention of what that individual just read. By allowing employees to actually take part in assessing their training and development, we foster individual engagement and promote continuous improvement of a person's skill and knowledge. It is desirable for employees to be involved in designing and evaluating their own training and any of your compliance programs because it's actually them who we're asking to change behavior. So by pulling them in and soliciting their feedback and actually improving upon their feedback can make the compliance compliance and efficiency much better. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this is, um, you just heard uh, Jackie give a very great summary of, you know, how the organizational culture matters and then how it trickles down to the individual differences and how we ought to, um, you know, take that into account as you develop training. Now, here's the next three slides. I'm going to look at a, a study that was conducted. Um, so this study is actually, the, the idea here is not to go in depth into this study, but just take the high level findings from this study and make the case for effectiveness in training. That's really the point of this study. So um, 
And again, this was uh, from the American Journal of the Public Health Study. And uh, it's basically, this was done, uh, there were like 95 uh, studies done with an N equals 20, about 20,000, okay? And uh, these were included in the analysis. So we'll get into that, but let, let's talk about the objective. Basically looking at effectiveness, okay? This was a 2006 a paper in that journal that was done. I don't know why the slide's not advancing. Hang on. Um, okay, so again, um, this is looking at the relative effectiveness and uh, of the training methods. And if you can, if you uh, think about it, 95 studies and about 21,000 articles were evaluated. So it's essentially a meta-analysis of the study that was done. And um, three types of intervention methods were discussed um, in this in this process. So you will see the three buckets here, from the least engaging to the most engaging. And we have the moderately engaging in the, in, in the middle right there. And uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, the types of uh, uh, things that fall in the least engaging category are, you know, lectures and um, written material and even videos. Uh, to some extent, if it's just talking heads, uh, is considered, was considered least engaging. Now for moderately engaging, um, it, it was more of a, you know, some, uh, you know, some sort of a um, feedback mechanism incorporated in the knowledge of the results. So, um, so, so, and this, most of it was, you know, provided in small groups allowing the learners to correct their mistakes and so on. So that's the moderately engaging one. And then the most engaging is where you're looking at behavioral modeling. Uh, I, I really like to then, uh, mention something here for this is there was a, um, the Dale Carnegie course that you may be familiar with that I had taken a while ago, um, maybe a decade ago, but the, the guy who won the final prize, the, the Dale Carnegie Award, was really brilliant. And he came, and what he wanted to do was he wanted to actually uh, show, demonstrate how certain things were done. Uh, he was managing, he was a, an executive of a small business. And um, you may have seen, for example, in uh, fast food places, in the restrooms, for example, whether it's a McDonald's or a Wendy's or something. If you notice, and you go to the restroom and you'll notice that there's a sign that says, employees must wash their hands before returning to work. I'm sure you've seen that many times. Well, so the instruction in that case is very clear, wash your hands. But how exactly <laughs> do they wash their hands and is it effective? Uh, and what is the risk if they don't uh, wash their hands properly because they're handling food? You know, the worst that can happen, you know, the consumers will get food poisoning. So instead of just putting instructions there, he decided to actually do a demonstration. So he came up there in the middle of the room, he rolled up his sleeves, he brought a basin, there was no running water, but there was, he brought a basin and a soap and a towel. And he rolled up his sleeves to the middle of his, between the, el all the way to the elbows. And then he started to wash with soap and he lathered up very nicely till the, to the point when he, he couldn't, you couldn't see his skin. But it wasn't up to just his palms that he washed. He washed all the way, almost to the elbow, but not quite. And he said, this is exactly how you must wash hands. And, and that's an illustration of what, a, what behavioral modeling is. And it is the most engaging. I'm sure that you agree. Um, because it doesn't simply give you instructions, but it tells you exact, exactly how it is done. Um, so 
And here are the results. So they, the results should not surprise us. So if we go down to the next slide, here's the thing. All methods produce some kind of a improvement, okay? There's no surprise there, except as the training be methods became more engaging, there was a much greater knowledge acquired. And in fact, this study actually showed that there were specific, specifically there were reductions in accidents, in illnesses and injuries and so on. So, so um, this, this again, to, to, to um, underscore the point of the effectiveness of training. And I'm going to now hand over the reins to Jackie, who will lead us to the, to the very end of the presentation. Jackie, you're on. Thank you, Ben. Can we go to the next slide, please? So we're gonna talk about the steps to evaluating the effectiveness of your training. So we can take the simple Kirkpatrick model to evaluate the effectiveness of the training. And I know that this concept is not really new to learning and development professionals. And those of us in quality compliance don't always think about it when we're looking at the effectiveness. But if we look at the Kirkpatrick model to use to maximize and demonstrate that, the first one being, did the delegate like it? So what did my trainee react to the read and understand or the training itself? Did the delegate learn and not simply check a box to complete the task? Was knowledge actually transferred, meaning did they use it? And were those skills and behaviors approved upon? Did the trainee impact the bottom line? Was the bottom line impacted and can I actually track a metric, see a correlation in the reduced waste from product and less deviations? That is very key. And then understand what the return on investment is. So after I've evaluated and understand the key performance indicators like reduction in waste and less deviations, we can then start to track and analyze the data. Did I have a return on my investment? Was the cost of adding this additional training, the time away from the employee from their job to train actually impact and provide um, you know, that, that return on the cost that I spent. So let's really remember to focus on the quality of training rather than just the quantity. The percentages of your read and understand completion, but you had high defects leading to CAPAs, your training really isn't being effective. We wanna see reduced error rates or rework, and we want to actually enhance the skills and the levels of those employees. And of course, you know, course pass rates and assessment scores, those are well too. However, we wanna make sure that that's leading to the desired knowledge being actually transferred. Next slide, please. So we talked about the effectiveness of the training, but what about identifying effective trainers? Trainers need to have, possess, the required qualities on the information being trained and the skills to desire to train others, essentially being effective teachers. They need to understand the underlying regulatory and organizational requirements and expectations, but be able to break them down into the digestible fragments that are suited for the different learning styles and the needs. We know that a trainer doesn't necessarily need to be a subject matter expert, and that's where most organizations fall short. They equate a subject matter expert as the trainer. However, not everybody who is great at what they do be great at teaching someone else. So simply put, instead of asking your subject matter expert to also train, you should actually look for your subject matter expert to work closely, very closely, with trainers to develop the training material and ensure the accuracy of the information. And then you allow the qualified or the effective teacher or trainer to add that engagement of the training. Next slide, please. So here's a quick polling question for you. How much time do employees have for training? Eight hours, 
four hours, 24 minutes, or what training? And I'll give you guys some time to go ahead and answer that. Okay, let's go to the next slide and actually find out the answer. So how much time do employees have for training? Trends and new concepts are in any industry and they usually come from somewhere and some perceived problem or a need. This particular graphic, um, this is from Burson and it was from 2015 but is still relevant today. And the answer is actually right in the middle of the graphic. So only 1% is given to employees to focus on training and development. So if we were to pretend that that's a standard 40-hour work week, because nobody works more than 40 hours, I'm sure, it, that actually equates to only 24 minutes in a week or 4.8 minutes a day. And really what's interesting is all of this busy slide information actually suggests that this is not going to be changing. And we're going to need to figure out how do we develop people at a rate of 24 minutes a week. Next slide, please. So if we actually need to develop and improve the retention of information that a person is being trained on, again, 24 minutes a week, how about microlearning, which is the concept of teaching and delivering content to learners in small, very specific bursts of information? We know that SOPs are not going to be replaced, right? Procedures should be pulled and they're referenced when performing tasks. However, to improve upon the retention and solidify the basic aspects of the SOP, we should be using contextual imagery or things like that to recap the information in the SOP in a different learning style. So really, micro-learning is actually supplemental to and just reinforcing the primary message of your SOP. It's not meant to replace. Next slide, please. What does bundling or delivery of micro-learning with SOPs and other training look like? Really, the answer is blended learning. So the brain's ability to remember will increase when a person hears and sees something together. Repeat exposure enforces, reinforces the learning and the memory retention, right? I hear and I forget, I see, I remember, I do and I understand. There's a very clear value in standardizing material that all trainees receive, right, in an SOP, but providing that same message and reinforcing the information in multiple learning styles for folks such as on-the-job training, instructor-led, other various micro-learning. Really what we're trying to do is improve that retention, change the behavior, and increase the skill. So an employee that has a new and improved skill set, rather than just becoming a reactor to the same line, line after again in an SOP. So let's think about typically SOP is issued for training and within 30 days made effective. What if your blended learning expanded over those 25, 30-day periods? So you're introducing another type of learning to the trainee, providing reinforcement of the information and touching on those various learning styles that folks have across the organization. Next slide, please. Scientifically, does this work? And is it even worth exploring? We would say yes. The, the hippocampus can only store about 20 minutes of information before it begins to overwrite the previously gathered information. So really imagine that a, a new hire receiving 10 to 20 or more read and understand SOPs in one week. How much of that first SOP is really being retained before the next one is overwritten with more detail? So really the key to long-term information retention is to just retrieve the information from training and memory retention by reinforcing that information 
over and over again, and really that should come from bursts of various micro-learning types. Next slide, please. So cost versus investment. I said earlier that training, right, should be really reviewed as an investment and not the cost of doing business. You might be looking at adding micro-learning as just something to add dollar signs to your curriculum. But by putting in the effort to create more and effective engaging training, you are going to see reduced in cost of defect remediation or waste and throwaway product. We can also think about other ways that micro-learning can help with costs. So for example, you don't have to shut down a product line to pull people off to do an ILT. Instead, you could have various micro-trainings available, either in an iPad or a tablet that's easily accessible in the area. Next slide, please. So we, like I said before, we know that SOPs are going to be pulled when doing an activity but how can the task be more easily understood and absorbed? Really trying to change that behavior. People learn in multiple ways, and by not providing various hits to all of the learning types leaves gaps in knowledge. So where does that leave you, and what can you actually take away from this presentation? Really, we would say make compliance development just as important as professional development, keeping that from the message from the top down and putting that out in the full culture of the organization. Compliance is not just in those of us in quality. Your qualified trainer really should be someone who's able to teach others. So don't just strictly look at your subject matter expert to be that trainer. Instead, leverage someone with that training capability who has the desire and the skill sets to break down information and actually transfer that over to someone else to learn. Your subject matter expert should work closely with that trainer, though. And then identifying the key performance indicators or your KPIs that you're trying to improve. So you're not going to be able to look at your return on investment unless you really specifically nail down what you're looking to change. So take reduction in waste or reduction in errors, and that's where you want to start with. Start with the most critical training tasks or tr critical training function, identify the KPI, and work towards that to build your baseline. And then really evaluate if microlearning is right for you and your organization. Remember that the micro-learning is reinforcement. It's not to replace or to build on a new skill development. It's to help supplement and provide the additional level of engagement for your trainees. And with that, is there anything you'd like to add, Ben? Um, the only thing I wanted to say uh, was that, you know, the when we, when we think about the compliance development uh, as part of the professional development, most organizations, and this is, I mean, every organization is guilty of this, is that the compliance or quality is another bullet uh, in their list of objectives for the, for the whole, organ, for, the, for the year. And uh, I've been a strong proponent that you should not put that as a separate item but whatever you do in your business to essentially institutionalize that compliant, compliant or compliance behavior throughout. So I hope that makes sense. And um, I think with that, we let me hand this ball over to Amanda. Um, Amanda, you're up. Thank you, Jackie and Ben. Um, before we start the Q&A, I just wanted to call out some of the resources that our content from the pre presentation came from. So I'll just give you a quick moment to take a look at the references. Okay, so now uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with the Q&A. So at this time, feel free to type in your questions or comments into the chat box. Now, the first question that we got, um, I want to address to Ben and Jackie. Um, so what are your thoughts on organizations that reward employees based on their compliant behavior? Do you think this strategy works? I mean, I'll, uh, I'll 
start off with that first. I, I think that re rewards come in various ways, but showing that compliance matters across the organization um, and showing that the reward comes from, you know, less free work and in other touchy-feely ways, perhaps, you know, we've got um, badging that we're giving them out, um, you know, gold stars, various things like that. If a company is putting the culture of compliance and, um, you know, one of the top priorities and actually communicating that across, I think that they're going to see benefits from it. You know, uh, I would like to add uh, one more thing to that is, uh, you know, there, again, you know, there's, when we look at organizations, you know, there's a wide range of organizations. Some of them are very good at providing effective training uh, all the way to others who have zero training. Um, so, so sometimes training in itself is a, a great uh, motivator for, a, for, a, for an individual, uh, you know. So, again, it depends on uh, what what the subject is and so on and so forth. But here's my take on the awards piece. Sometimes organizations, um, I think, diminish the value of an award or a reward uh, by by you know kind of making it casual. Uh, so so um, we need to we need to uh, make sure that. Any award that is being given to the organ uh, to the to the personnel is uh, sincere. You know, if it's a sincerely uh, given, you know, and I think you know people are smart. They they understand if if we are being sincere or not. So anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Um, Thanks. Ben. Any other questions we have? Yeah, we actually just got a question from Stephanie. So how do we encourage program project sponsors to not rely on subject matter experts as trainers? So I think that's a really good question and it is something that organizations struggle with. Um, there's a couple of things, you know, that you can do if you still want to utilize your SMEs as trainers. There's obviously training itself that those folks can go to. Or, you know, I would suggest starting to pilot a little bit of that, right? So you have somebody who is capable of actually um, taking that information, breaking it down, and work closely with your subject matter experts. Again, you're not going to see changes unless you make small steps to actually do the change itself. So, Stephanie, I would recommend taking um, one of your core SOPs and your training and actually working with someone who is a trainer working with the SME to get that message and see the difference that it might make in your organization. Thanks, Jackie. Um, we have another question that just came in. So from your experience, what are some examples of successful microlearning techniques that have worked well for your clients? So I've seen clients do simulations in small bursts of microlearning, and that seems to be really engaging. And again, it's like on the high spectrum of the retention and engagement. So that tends to be one of the most um, influential changes and, and pieces of information for the microlearning. Thanks, Jackie. Ben, do you have anything to add? No, I think that, that was well said. Okay, great. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions, so we're just going to move on to the next part. So I um, just wanted to um, remind everyone, um, the webinar will be recorded, so you should be receiving an email later this week. Um, but we also just wanted to let you know about a few upcoming events that we're going to be attending. Uh, so next week, Cornerstone and the EDUCE group will be at the HR Tech Conference in Vegas from October 10th through the 13th. So if you're planning on attending the event, feel free to stop by and say hello. Additionally, you can find Cornerstone at the CLO in Pharmaceuticals event, November 16th through the 17th in Boston. So with that, um, we're gonna conclude today's webinar. I wanna first thank our presenters, Ben and Jackie, 
And of course, thank all of you for attending. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the webinar and came away with actionable insights that you can implement for your organization. And as a reminder, um, like I said before, we're gonna send a link to the recording later this week. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks everyone, have a great day.